you know, something I say to my kids, I'm like, I, you know, I don't care what your friends want to do or if you're all surrounded by people that work at Facebook and Twitter and everything else. Like, is that what you want to do? Like, that's cool if you do want to do that. But if I were you, I'd figure out like, what do I want to do every single day that I can actually make money doing? And what what is going to be happy to me and give me like, you know, hope and if I can solve problems for people like what you ultimately care about. And that's what's hard. Doing the impossible and enjoying what you're doing is is like, I think the most important thing you can do as a parent. Well, welcome to another episode of the Hope Strategy Podcast. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. It's the beginning of December. I'm sitting with a Christmas tree behind me and uh, it's a great time of year. We had a fantastic conversation to kick off December today with Kara Golden, who is the CEO, founder of Hint Water, drinkhint.com. Josh, why don't you give us the, uh, the bio? So Kara is the author of this book, Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. She's also been on Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business. She was on the list of Fortune's Most Powerful Women Entrepreneurs. She was the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year for Northern California. And she's had this amazing career. She told us this amazing story about a firsthand interaction with Jeff Bezos where she was helping him build bookcases in 1996. You get that story in the podcast. This book though, the back of this book, the endorsements here are from Sheryl Sandberg, who's the CEO of Facebook, founder of Lean In or author of the book Lean In. You've got Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, John Legend, like that John Legend, Adam Grant, like Guy Kawasaki. I mean, there are all these crazy endorsements of this book, Undaunted, from her. And of course, she started this hundred million something dollar beverage company that nobody had ever started before. And she created this category all by herself. And her story is just incredible and inspiring. And then it's funny to listen to her when uh, her son asks, how come there aren't more female CEOs? And she's like, I don't know. It's like, she's one, she did it. Why aren't yeah. more women doing it? And she's like, I don't know. I just did it. She is a hustler and she uh, is incredibly impressive and somebody for I mean, I, I, we could have talked all day and asked story after story after story. And I want to, again, another one of these interviews where I'm like, we got to have a, have a round two of this conversation because, but the people that just make things happen are the ones that as I've continued to put it, get in over their head and, and face these huge obstacles, but learn to enjoy it. She said, get in over your head and love it in a different words at the very end of the, the interview. We keep hearing that. That's a common theme over and over and over again. And then you think of people that maybe just don't like that approach or are scared of that approach or whatever that may not, you know, take advantage of opportunities. I loved that bookcase story. I'm so glad that you followed up about the Jeff Bezos thing. Cause that bookcase story is a perfect example of that, mm -hmm. that she's like, I'm the best bookcase builder in the world, but she's never actually built a bookcase. I love it. But, she, but it's like, she knows that she can show up and build bookcases yeah. with Jeff Bezos. Sure. Like she can get the job done. It's not like she's necessarily lying. I mean, she's putting some spin on that, but it's more like she's saying, I know I can get the job done that he needs done. And this is a way for me to get in and he'll be glad door. for it. And I'm, I'll be glad for it. And everybody wins. Yeah. The, and uh, she, so yeah. many times entrepreneurs do that where they're like, I mean, that's like uh, Richard Branson with his whole story about starting Virgin Airlines that he had a bunch of people who needed a flight and he's like, let's go book a private plane. And let's go get a flight. Like, let's do it. He never owned an airline. He didn't know anything about an airline, but he's like, you know, let's figure it out. I've seen that firsthand. I mean, we've, we've talked about some of the, in the interview you did with me about some of the, when we took Hong Kong off the ground and got some of those deals, we had some of those experiences, but one of our, one of our biggest clients in the States, it was kind of a similar thing that, that to her story with time where time magazine, where it was like, yeah, this is interesting. If you're ever in town and I was like, this is a big opportunity. And so I booked a, a flight to the city and showed up at 6am on a, on a flight and just text him. So, Oh, I happen to be in town. We should meet up <laughs> and, and went to the office. And now we've been working together for a couple of years and it's been an amazing partnership. So I, I, 
I, I'm trying to, and I keep asking the question. I don't know. I need to figure out how to word the question the best possible way, but it's like, I'm trying to figure out what that is. And is it a nature thing? Is it a nurture thing? Is it, how, how are some, how do some of these people find hope in obstacles and other people just don't, you know, there's so much to it. And so it's, I love having these conversations. Chock full of great nuggets, great stories. Uh, really enjoyed the time that we had to talk with Kara Golden. Jump into it. Enjoy. Something is happening in our world. Time is very precious. I'm going to show you how great I am. Hope in the face of difficulty. More than machinery, we need humanity. Hope in the face of uncertainty. I'm better now than I was. I'm experienced now. Changing the world can happen anywhere and anyone can do it. The audacity of hope. This is the Hope Strategy Podcast with Corey Blake and Josh Steinle. Well, let's get started with where you came from and what was your upbringing like and how did that lead to the business world? Yeah. So it, one of my first memories was my dad sitting us down for a family meeting when I was three years old in Minneapolis and he died in Minnesota. And uh, he had been traveling to Scottsdale, Arizona for his, uh, he worked at Armor Food Company at the time. And so he decided to buy a house that my dad was like the original, you know, kind of advertising guy that just like, I mean, one would have thought that he would have actually come and asked my mom and like told us, asked us kids like, nope, he just went and bought a house in Scottsdale and actually Phoenix, but it was right on the border of of Phoenix and Scottsdale and moved us all there. You know, as, as we were talking about before, I was like an original settler. I mean, there was no one there. There were like a hundred thousand people in, in Phoenix and Scottsdale. It was crazy. And you know, it was, it, it was a super interesting time. I mean, I have, uh, I'm the last of five. My, I have a brother and sister that are 15 and 16 years older than me. And so in many ways, like it was like almost like a second family. And then my parents had like, you know, 10 years in between and then decided to have three more kids. And so I was super tight with my brother and sister, but my parents didn't have me until they were 40, which back then was like, I had the oldest parents on the block and they were like, plus I had two brothers who were super wild and like had lots of fun and parties and everything. And so the only other thing I remember my parents saying to me is like, don't embarrass me and, uh, and come home safe. But basically they were, I was super, super independent. Everybody plays sports in the family. I was a competitive gymnast. I was a runner. So I was constantly just doing something to kind of keep myself busy and learn new things. And that's, you know, who I was as a kid. And uh, one of the stories I talk about actually in the book is, is my, you know, kind of first official job was at a toy store in Old Town Scottsdale because I, you know, figured everybody else in my house is, has a job and makes money. So why don't I go and get a job? And I remember coming home and saying to my mom, like, oh, I got a job. And she's like, you're 14. And I'm like, I know, but it's super fun. I, I'm going to work at ABC Toy Store. And she's like, did they ask you how old you were? And I'm like, no, not really. I'm like going to do the cash register on Sunday. And I think it'd be super fun. And what was crazy is this, the woman who was the owner of the store was going through a divorce. And so she was like, you're so good at like knowing what toys kids like would like and like working with customers because I was a kid. And so she's like, will you go to the toy fairs with me? So I was like the original, like Tom Hanks, like I got to (laughs) like figure out buying. And that was like the first sense that I got in, in actually like profits and margins. And like, I didn't even know what I was learning, but I was just really like markups like that, that whole world like came to me when I was 14. So I was like walking into business classes when I was in college and knew way more than these other kids only because I just had this hands-on experience and not really knowing kind of what I was learning. But 
Yeah, I mean, you know, my my dad, my dad, as I mentioned, was with Armor Food Company and had developed this brand inside of Armor Food Company called Healthy Choice. And uh, so they were acquired by ConAgra. Um, but it's, a, you know, another really funny story. Like people always ask, like, how did your dad, like, why did he do that? Did he like really care about health? And, and uh, like, kind of, but he also, um, my my mom had decided to go back to work when I went to kindergarten and she had some more time on her hands. And so my dad, I don't know if you guys will remember this, but Stouffer's TV dinners were like the thing, like you put them into the oven and then you got like this food. And my dad was like, this is like mystery meat. Like it's like spam, you know, like there's no way I'm going to eat this because my mom was working sometimes into the evenings. And so, and so my dad worked in this food company. So he was like, I'm going to make a better product than Stouffer's TV. TV dinner and I'm going to like go and like source best possible ingredients. And so a longer story and, and way down the line. But what's interesting is I think my dad was like one of the first people to act, to actually talk about sourcing. I mean, no one was talking about sourcing, certainly not in the 1970s and, and not even today. I mean, people don't even like talk about sourcing. And, you know, he was talking about like the backstories of, of the shrimp fishermen that he met off the coast of Georgia and why they go out at a certain time in the morning because the quality of the shrimp was like that much higher. And selfishly, he like wanted that kind of food, but he also felt like those stories actually were great for the consumer as well, that the consumer really wanted to know those stories too. So, you know, I would like live with these stories. My dad would like talk to me about like Salisbury steak and like shrimp and stuff. And I'm like, does anyone really care about the stuff? And he's like, no, they do. They do. So yeah, I mean, I think, you know, he was definitely like probably an early, you know, crusader on, on the concept of like marketing and storytelling and brand. As a kid, you don't know that. Yeah. Is this, is this one of those things where you hindsight look back and say, oh my gosh, there's a ton of parallels between my career and what my dad did back then? Because, because I mean, look at your story with Hint. And his and, and creating this new product that, you know, you you knew that you needed to drink more water. You were trying to get healthier in that way, you know, drinking more water. You said water's boring. I don't really like drinking water. And there's a reason why people don't like to drink water. What if I put some fresh products and some fresh fruit in it and then you create this new product? I mean, there's so many parallels between that and your dad saying, I'm not feeding the kids these TV dinners, yeah. you know. Is that, is that something you noticed throughout the journey or is that something you look back on at the end and, you know, one of those hindsight things like, Oh, wow. Who knew, you know, that I was being influenced in that way. You know, I I think I've always noticed points along the way that were, you know, kind of similar. But another thing that I talk about a lot is that we, you know, we all have this journey, right? And we all have, it's kind of the sliding doors model where, you know, I meet you guys, right? And and I'm a huge believer that that leads to other things. Like that is a, that is a like pin, Right. And we don't know exactly good and bad right along the way. And I feel like with my dad, I was seeing and experiencing so many things. For example, I was seeing what large companies can do like for, you know, brands and also what they can't do. So like large brands in general are not innovative. And so I've always said like entrepreneurs should not be afraid of large brands because what they do, and especially if they're public companies, is that they just keep doing the same thing day after day until, you know, their stock starts tanking right? Or their sales start going down. And that's what they do in every single category, right? But I know that because I've, I've lived it, right? Like I've watched large companies. And when you're like running a product inside of a large company, you know, that's what you do. You look at your number. It's very similar to being an entrepreneur, but then it also has, you know, aspects that are, you know, not similar, including the fact that, you know, you've got money as long as you've got a, a great product to do marketing. If you're an entrepreneur, you're sitting here worried about where am I going to go raise money? Or you've got planograms in stores that are already set up for you. In my case, like I, I said to my dad, how do I get into Safeway? And he's like, I have no idea. Cause that was all set for him. Like mm-hmm. it's, it, so that part is really different. So 
I think that early on, even when we were launching Hint and we were kind of taking this around to different people trying to, you know, raise money, different venture firms, they would, they would all be afraid of like Coke and Pepsi. And I'm like, I'm not really afraid of them. Maybe I should be, but I'm, I'm just not because they don't innovate. Like they're not really focused on, on that. So I don't think that I would have like learned a lot of those lessons if I wouldn't have been living, you know, in, in this house that was just constantly surrounded by it. Do you think your dad, if you would have lived in a different time, he would have, cause he kind of created a new, new brand and a new product within a brand, right? Because he worked for that. And he, is that, is that right? Am I understanding that correctly? He yeah. created. So do you think, did he have any entrepreneurial ambitions or do you think if you would have lived in a different time when creating that product on his own may have been an actual reality, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, frankly, like I learned it through writing my book, um, you know, a lot of sort of my opinions on it, but I think my dad was, um, my dad feared being an entrepreneur primarily because he had five kids and he had, you know, financial responsibilities and, and really he had values and things that were really important to him. So my dad, even when I had risen through the ranks at AOL and, you know, was the youngest vice president in the company was, you know, one of the only females, there was like, you know, a ton to be like really proud of. My dad is like, she, she went to college and I was like, really? Like, <laughs> that's like all you got, you know, and it was just, but it was for him, like to have five kids graduate from college was like a big deal. And I was like, really? Like, I, I mean, it's, it's all good. He valued that even over his own happiness and his own life of what he wanted to do. Right. I and think he generally was a, it was just a different time, right? The priorities were different and the possibility, the realm of possibility was different for yeah. entrepreneurs in this, like you said, the 60s, 70s, even 80s, you know, than it is obviously in the 2000s, right? Yeah. It, it's a, it was a different ball game. Totally. And it's also like you feared having more than two jobs in your yeah. lifetime. Like you like really thought, I mean, there were pensions, the world was different. And so today, you know, people ask me all the time, like, how did you have the courage? Why did you feel like, okay, to take the risk to go and, and launch this company? I was like, I can always go back to tech. I can still 15 years later, go get a job in tech. I, I know I can, if that's what I want to do. And I could do it like one week after I started Hint too. But, but it's like, I think knowing that, and especially during 2020, I think if anybody's not thinking this, like there's, there's no job security. Like there just isn't, right? There's people who yeah. were doing great prior to, prior to March. And then, you know, their company tanked because they needed something like a pandemic to really test their business model, right? Yeah. And, and it's true. And so you have to, figure out, I think that that's why, you know, the, the, the idea of actually figuring out what you want to do every day, like, what do you want to get up and do every day? And, you know, something I say to my kids, I'm like, I, you know, I don't care what your friends want to do, or if you're all surrounded by people that work at Facebook and Twitter and everything else, like, is that what you want to do? Like, that's cool if you do want to do that. But if I were you, I'd figure out like, what do I want to do every single day that I can actually make money doing? And what, what is going to be happy to me and give me like, you know, hope. And if I can solve problems for people, like what you ultimately care about. And that's, what's hard. The mindset is like, grow up, be a manager, maybe be a CEO of a company and like, you've achieved victory. Right. Yeah. And I know a lot of people who have done that and who are not very happy. Right. And I think my dad is like a great example where, you know, he was like, you know, still to this day, I mean, healthy choice is one of the number one products that ConAgra carries, right? Like a brand that like has stuck yet, you know, it just wasn't what he was like, you know, super, super, passionate about. So I, that's like a whole conversation that I think is really, really important. Yeah. Throughout your story, there's a lot of examples of, and, and the title of the book is Undaunted, which, you know, says nothing's going to get in my way. I, I'm going to, there it is. I'm going to, I am going to push forward at all costs and I'm going to overcome obstacles and I'm going to overcome trials and I'm going to pursue 
you know, steadily the course that I'm on the, throughout your story and, and the research that I've done, I've seen so many times where one of the things we've talked about on the podcast with other people, one of the things that I've said in teaching entrepreneurship classes and stuff is that entrepreneurs need to learn how to get in over their head and love it. And then another thing, and you just kind of mentioned it is opportunity capitalized on creates more opportunity, right? It, it, and like, those are those pins in the ground that you said, like, here I am. And I just capitalized on an opportunity. I met these new people. I made these new connections and other opportunities will stem from that. Right. So I love the story of you. I believe you applied for a job at, was it fortune magazine? I tried. I, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't, so, you, yeah. so you applied, you applied for a job. You get a letter back that says, Basically, like you put it in an interview, I heard you got Dear John and they said, no, no, thanks. But if you're ever in town, come by. We'd love to see you. And you said, OK, great. Thanks for the invitation. So you go to New York, you go in and you meet with them and say, hey, here I am. I got this letter to the HR department. I got this letter. I'm, I'm here to, you know, to, to meet whoever said I can meet them. Anyways, it turned out you didn't get the job at Fortune, but you did end up getting a job. And it, it sounds like a huge launch pad for you as a job at Time Magazine where you were for a couple of years. And then uh, we'll talk about what came after that. But a lot of people would have gotten that letter and said, dang, I didn't, I didn't get the gig, I mm-hmm. move on to the next thing or man, you know, let it really push them down and then they stay down. You know, I, I'm trying to figure out, I know a lot of really successful entrepreneurs, I myself, Josh, we try to be successful entrepreneurs every single day. And there's just this little extra gear that people put themselves into when when it gets tough or when they get the no to say, no, I'm, a, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find a, a way to make this happen. Where does that, that tenacity to keep pushing, where does that come from for you? I think I'm always, you know, maybe it's, it's searching for, I, I think I'm an optimist in general, but I think yeah. it's always searching for, you know, whether it's fun or the win or, you know, like how can I, you know, close the day with some sort of good, right? Like that I'm always like searching for that. And, and, you know, I talked before about being an athlete, like just even, even, you know, doing gymnastics. Like I would just sit there. I was really good at, at, at bars and, and vault. And I was terrible at floor and like beam. And so I would like never end a day like being on the floor. Cause it was just freaking hard. Like, and I was just, and I could go on the bars and vault and just do things like all day long. So I would always look for something that not necessarily that was easy, but something that I knew that there was a pretty good shot at me being able to be, to figure this out and be successful. So I think for me, that letter was, you know, I thought, well, at the very least I get to go to New York city. Right. Like I was just, I don't know. Like I was just like, it'd be cool. Like it was scary. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was scary though. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, even the first day, I I remember the the first day of of my job, I was staying with a friend of mine. I don't know how familiar you guys are with New York city, but it was actually a friend of my sister's and it was on St. Mark's between B and C down in the East village. And that was not a good neighborhood. And it was, she was in like a fifth floor walk up. I remember the first day of work. I had never ridden the subway before in my life. I like grew up in Arizona. I liked subways were like super scary. So I'm like, how do you take the subway? I mean, and she's like, Oh, you just go get a coin and you just go down the street and like go underground. And I mean, it was just a lot. Right. And so I walk out the door, I'm all like focused on the fact that I'm going to figure out the subway. And there is a spray painting figure of a dead body like right on the street and I was like wow and there's these cops and they had just taken the dead body away and I was like wow that's that's crazy and I looked at the cop and I was like so did somebody die and he said they did they just like took him away and I was like wow okay I gotta go to the subway now like because I gotta like get to work I don't want to be late you know to work and you know it's funny because I've told that story before and it wasn't like I ever forgot about it. Obviously I'm like sharing this with you guys years and years later, but I think it's just, I kept thinking 
along the lines of what's the worst that can happen when bad things would happen, I would be like, okay, well, it didn't actually happen to me. I mean, it was really horrible, but it, it, it's not my situation, right? Like it is a bad situation. There's many people who would just be like, okay, I need to mo- leave New York right now. I yeah. need to like not go to work or whatever. But uh, for whatever reason, I think I just, I just decide like instead, like, wow, I'm really lucky. I'm really fortunate. Well, it's, and, an, abundance, it's an abundance mindset, right? Versus a, yeah. a lot of times you get in that situation and oh. you're right. I shouldn't be, what am I doing? I'm, I'm from Arizona. How did I end up here? I don't know how to get on the subway. I just saw this terrible thing happen. I'm out. You're like, this is, that's it. You know, yeah. all the negatives, it sounds like you've had an abundance mindset, which has led you to take advantage of opportunities. And then again, more opportunities have continued to stem from those, right? Yeah, no, totally. And then I would like get stuck on this, you know, if nothing else, like I would later on, like think, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm just so fortunate. And maybe it, maybe that was a sign to be more careful or, or yeah. whatever, whatever it was. And, you know, and I think like so many people have, you know, tried to figure out not only me, but I think other entrepreneurs on like why they think like things like that. I don't know, but I, I think it's, it, it's part tenacity. It's part creativity. It's part, you know, survival, like in some ways. And, and I think at the end of the day too, I, I really try and enjoy every single day. Cause I'm a huge, I've always been a huge believer that we're, you know, we're sort of gifted with whatever we're given and we just have to go and experience and, and do that. So yeah. Sounds like a healthy dose of gratitude in there as well. A huge gratitude. And, you yeah. know, and, and I think like that, that's another reason why I really wanted to get the book out too, because I think so often like people will say to me, was it, you know, tough to raise money as a woman? And I'm like, I don't know. I've never been a guy. Like I hate raising money. Like I, I like to me, it's like the, the worst part of being an entrepreneur is raising money. And it gets easier when your financials are better. Like that, yeah. that's as much as I can say, but has it like taken longer for me to like raise money? I, I have no idea. Like, it's just, it sucks, right? Like doing it. And so I'm like, why focus on that? And I think like that has been my message on so many things. Like people are like, oh my God, you got kicked out of Starbucks. Like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, I have to figure out what to do with the inventory before I have to like destroy it. But they're like, are you mad? Are you angry? Like, are you depressed? Like, I'm like, I don't know. Like, I just, I'm you, trying you to. You mean the product got kicked out of Starbucks? You didn't, you didn't personally get kicked out of Starbucks? <laughs> no, I didn't personally. I haven't done that yet. I don't know. At first I was like, fun. I wonder why she got kicked out of a Starbucks. Yeah, oh, I don't know. No, no, no. Um, yeah, the product got kicked out of Starbucks. But again, like, I mean, it's something I talk about in the book as well that, you know, a couple of weeks later after that whole really horrible thing happened, I mean, it was millions of dollars worth of inventory. I was trying to figure out how to share with my investors that my financials were going to be a mess because 40% of my business was like about like went away. And that? like, I think it was 2012. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so it was crazy. And, you know, we were, it's, it's a lesson that I feel like we can learn from our bad things that happen or mistakes or whatever. But that lesson in particular is one where I didn't know at the time, like why it was happening. It just like, you know, Howard Schultz, like woke up, literally like woke up and decided that he wanted a bunch of food in the cases. Uh, remember, like he didn't used to have like food in those cases. And then he decided I'm going to have a bunch of sandwiches and stuff in there. And it's going to be like eight bucks or more. And yeah. you couldn't sell a bottle of Hint water for more than $2. I mean, basically he was going to, it was a higher ring. It was better margins. And, and so, so yeah, so we were out. So it made no sense at all. We were doing great in sales. It made no sense to me. It made a huge sense to him, but I kept thinking where, like, where is this going? And then a couple of weeks later, we got a phone call from Amazon and, um, and Amazon said, Hey, we, we buy your product all the time. This is the buyer. We buy your product all the time at Starbucks. And we really want to put it into this grocery business that we're going to put the gas on and how long is it, what's the lead time to actually get product? And I said, oh, I actually have like product in the warehouse that we overran. And, you know, the first thing out of his mouth was, was I buy the product 
at Starbucks. And I thought like, that is the reason why we were in there. And then the door. And now, I mean, today, 55% of our overall business is online. And like, that is not normal for a beverage company, right? So it's, and, and it's so, helped turn you into the largest, and you're, correct me here, but it, you're, you're the largest beverage company that isn't owned by Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Snapple, Dr. Pepper, something like that, right? Is yeah. It, so non-alcoholic, non-alcoholic um, yeah. yeah, non-alcoholic private beverage um, that doesn't have a relationship with Coke, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, Snapple. So yeah, and and, clearly, and a lot of that is because of that directness, right? Yeah, because you know what I figured out when we ultimately went into Amazon was so I had dealt with Amazon in my previous life. I ran AOL's e-commerce partnerships and uh, actually have a have a crazy Amazon Jeff Bezos story from way back when when they were a client of mine um, back in you know the mid '90s when Jeff was just getting started out, but uh, but. Anyway, it was, um, you know, it was that like I knew the deal that basically we weren't going to get any data or any, you know, information off of those customers. He like fundamentally believed that he was um, that the people buying hint off of Amazon were his customers and not my customers. And so so the only way for me to get the data was to actually to start my own direct to consumer business. So the, our personal direct to consumer business on drinkhint.com is like 40, a little over 40% of the business. And then we still um, are on Amazon as well. But, um, you know, it was, it was like a light bulb went off when we were doing so well on Amazon early on because we had been told by many of the tech firms that were in the Googles and the Facebooks that, you know, people who are drinking hint are drinking more of hint than any other product, which they're happy about because they're healthier and they've seen leave it to Google to sort of track the stuff, but that they're seeing, you know, higher performance of the engineers when they're drinking water or, or drinking a product like hint or whatever. But so those same people who were like going to the office and were, were drinking tons of hint, it also ends up that they weren't really grocery, grocery shopping. Right. And so we had been focused on grocery and trying to like deal with grocery, but now suddenly we're available online and there, and Amazon launched this thing called subscribe and save. And so they were just clicking subscribe and save and like over 70% of our business on Amazon is on subscription. And so we saw that really early on and we were, you know, fighting the battle at the stores trying to deal with, you know, Coke and Pepsi deals and planograms and everything. And then at the end of the day, we were, we were like, you know, Amazon is no different than a Whole Foods or Target or whatever. They own all their data. We don't know who our customers are. Now they literally own Whole Foods. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) they own Whole Foods. transition happened too. (laughs) But so seven years ago when we launched our direct-to-consumer business, and that's another story in the book, it was, you know, a battle with our, with, with my board and, and with our, with our main investor, because they were like, why why are you doing this? You know, I get that you mean competing against Amazon with your own competing against Amazon. I'm like, we're, we're not competing against Amazon. It's just, we're building, we're getting data. We're like, we want to know who our customer is. And, um, and they're like, but they're going to undercut you on price. And, I'm like, I've been dealing with this for years. This is like, this is my baby. I, I, I get the pricing thing that goes on. But at the end of the day, like, unless we actually know who our customers are, then we'll never ultimately, we won't have a relationship with them. Yeah. They'll have, they'll have a relationship with all of these stores. But seven years ago, nobody really knew why. Fast forward, you know, into the pandemic, like I've got well over a million consumers that are in our database and guess what? Like Coke and Pepsi don't, they don't know who their customer is. Like their customer belongs to Walmart and all of the rest of them. And so I could actually, when there were all kinds of issues with supply and being able to get the store shelves stocked, et cetera, because electronic EDI stuff was all messed up all across the U S for whatever reason. Um, you know, we were able to just go out to our consumers and say, we have plenty of stock in the warehouse. Do you want some? And they were like, 
Yeah. And we had like 80% of our base like ordered in mid-March. I mean, it was wow. insane. And so that to me was like, again, seven years ago, did I know there was a pandemic coming? Did I know the reason why I wanted to have that relationship with our customer? No, but I'm really happy I did right and and so i think that that is you know it's the future of, of e-commerce it, it, it's not about it's never been about about really having that you know the best price i mean for us it was always about selection and and making sure that we had everything available at all times for our consumer but also having that relationship with the consumer fantastic lesson for entrepreneurs to hold on to your data Kara, can you go back? So you were an executive at AOL. You had this career in tech. Can you take us to that founding moment where you had the idea for Hint and how you came up with that and decided, I'm going to turn this into a company? Yeah. So I uh, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur because I, I didn't ever think that I was going to be an entrepreneur other than sort of thinking it'd be, it, it's like, I like the lifestyle better. I had been in Silicon Valley um, for about 10 years at that point, I had worked for a spin out of, of Apple, a Steve Jobs idea. Back was Steve Jobs on that? I didn't, I didn't, I like, uh, I wish I did, but it was, you know, his idea to actually take graphics and stick them onto a CD because the, um, speed of like, of transmission was just too slow. And that's why everything was, you know, all the old computers that are out there, they're all text-based because, it just, the bandwidth just wasn't there to be able to put graphics across. So I had read about Steve when I was living in New York in the early nineties. And I was like, this dude like sees the future. Like I was yeah. just like, he is so smart. And like, that's, that's so crazy. So when I moved to Silicon Valley, I was like, I had a short list of people that I thought were just like really admirable. And I, I thought, I'd heard about this project inside of Apple and then these four guys had spun it out. I mean, I didn't even think there would ultimately be a job there. I just decided, I, I just decided, why don't I just pick up the phone and offer to buy him coffee? And then as I'm like meeting with this guy to talk about this product called to market, that's when he was like, wait, what did you do in New York? Oh, you worked in magazines and then you worked at CNN and you know, what were you doing at CNN? Oh, you were launching the airport channel. I put those monitors into airports. And again, like there was, it was just like, there was no metric for sort of like what we would charge airports, how we would ultimately get it done. But I was the scrappy girl from Arizona that was just like, Hey, JFK, like, can we actually put a monitor in there and run some advertising at, at a gate? And they were like, wait, what? You're going to pay us to actually put these in? Yeah, we're going to... And I had no idea what I was talking about, but I was putting these business plans together. So when I met these guys in Silicon Valley, they're, they're like, oh, okay, so we've got this disc. I'm like, I know all about this disc. And I know that it was the Steve Jobs idea, but um, how do you guys make money? And they're like, what do you mean? What do you mean make money? And I'm like, like money, like how, how, like you're going to put catalogers on this disc, but how are you going to make money? Well, we haven't really figured that out yet. And I'm like, well, you got to charge something. Otherwise, like, how will you actually stay alive? And they're like, well, I don't know. We just haven't really figured that out. Do you want to figure that out for us? And I'm like, okay, I had no idea what I was doing. Anyway, the net of it is, is that AOL acquired us like eight months later and then I ran e-commerce and shopping for AOL for seven years. And when I left, um, we were chatting a little bit about this a few minutes ago. I was running a team of like 200, had pimping, you know, job title. I was traveling constantly. It was, I felt like every single day people were coming to me and saying, mother, may I? Like, it was like, okay, here's what we're doing, blah, blah, blah. What do you think? Okay. Yes, go, you know, and doing this. And it was, it was a great ride and it was a lot of fun, but it was a billion dollars in revenue to AOL at, just for this department. And I just thought, do I hang out here until I, it's like 2 billion? I'm really, I couldn't describe it at the time what I was feeling, but I was bored. I now look at 
you know, this whole concept of lifelong learning that I think is so important for people at every single level that the the most bored C-suite executives that I know today are experiencing what I experienced back when I was leaving AOL that they couldn't describe it. You know, maybe they go and, you know, join boards or whatever, but that usually doesn't do it because you're not operators, right? People need to be constantly learning. And I think for me, when... I was, um, I was, you know, seeing this challenge that I had in my life, which was getting healthy. Um, after I had left AOL, I had three kids at the time I had, how do I put it? I gained, like I loved gaining weight through all my pregnancies and I had no idea how to get the weight off. And um, as my girlfriend said to me, when I told her, I'm, I was like, I'm 55 pounds higher than I've ever been in my life. Like I was like, it was like a, you know, a third of my weight. Like it was crazy how much weight I had gained. And also um, my skin had developed terrible adult acne that I didn't even have as a teenager. And then my energy levels were down. And that's when I, you know, thought, okay, I'm really going to pay attention to exercise and I'm really going to pay attention to, to what I'm putting into my body. Um, I went to a couple different great doctors. Everybody was focusing on food. Nobody could really figure out exactly what the issue was. You know, I was counting calories and trying different diets and nothing was working. And then finally, I looked down when I was in my kitchen at my Diet Coke. And that's when I like looked at all the ingredients and I thought, gosh, I, I like pay more attention to what I'm putting into my car than I do my body. Like I was like shocked. I had never, ever paid attention to the ingredients label. And I thought there's over 30 ingredients in this product. You know, what, like, what am I doing? And so then I just, as a test, just decided I'm going to stop drinking this Diet Coke and start drinking plain water and see what happens. And it was a chore. It was like, I, I just was like every day, okay, I've got to drink eight glasses and I line up eight glasses on the counter and people would come over to my house and they're like, what are the glasses? And I said, I have to drink eight glasses every single day. I hate water. Like I just, I'm so bored and I cheat all the time. Like I like, this is horrible, but for two and a half weeks, I basically stuck to it and drank the water. And then I got on the scale. So you, hate, you hate water one. And then you're also having to overcome an addiction of caffeine. Of totally. caffeine I didn't Diet think Coke. of it That's as a, a, I didn't think yeah. of it that way. Like I basically was like diet, diet soda is healthy. And people were like, yes. And I was like, I was so on the program and, yeah. you know, I've talked to executives at Coke and I mean, I was drinking between like eight and 12 a day. I was like, and that may seem like a lot, but I'm, a, I was a heavy user. There's actually like a label for me inside of, you know, Coca-Cola. You know, that is like, that, Yeah. Like I'm a heavy user, but I'm, I wasn't like, I wasn't unique. Right. Yeah. Like, but I had just been, I had just been drinking it and my body was like really rejecting it. And now I, you know, whole other topic, but you know, I tell people like, look, your skin is your, you know, biggest organ. Like when something is wrong with your skin that is like, hasn't been going on, like it's telling you that your insides, like something is really wrong. And this is what I was like slowly figuring out. So anyway, in addition to sort of clearing up my skin two and a half weeks later, I also lost 24 pounds in two and a half weeks, which was crazy, right? I was nuts. And so, you know, I went through this whole process of wondering if I was sick. Like, I, I mean, I had no idea what had happened. And that's when I You're thought, like, wait a second, I was drinking diet. How could I lose weight when I stopped drinking the diet soda? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it was crazy. And so, and so then when I looked at the, like, I wasn't going to go back at this point to, to drinking diet soda, but I was so bored. So I started slicing up fruit that was on my counter and people were like, did you think about like the calories or, and no, I like, I, I mean, the key thing that I found was, have you guys ever tried to like put juice into like a, you know, soda water or something like it's like just to add a little bit, yeah. it's like, it's, not, it's watered down. It's like weird, right? It's not, it's not supposed to be that way. So I thought fruit is way better because you slice it up and you throw it in there and it just gives you the taste of it. And then when I went to my local Whole Foods, I was like, I want 
this in a bottle and everything had sweeteners in it, whether it was sugar or diet sweeteners. And so I, you know, was convinced that San Francisco was just like not on the program. Like it must be somewhere else in the U.S. I had a trip out east that I went around to all these stores in New York and nobody had it. And then finally, I just said, wow, I found this hole in the market. Part of what I write about in this book is, is like, you know, I'd been a very successful tech executive, but I thought, how hard could it be to like launch a product at Whole Foods? And, you know, I had no idea that the industry was like 2000 products, how controlled it was by, you know, the Cokes and the Pepsis and the Dr. Pepper Snapples of the world. You know, I clearly had my doubts uh, along the way. I mean, the closest I had been to sort of understanding what a distributor was, was I had seen a Coke truck go down the street and I sort of knew that Cisco like distributed food products and that was it. And so I really was like trying to figure out like, how do I figure this out? And it was really freaking hard. And it was just, it wasn't easy. And it was, you know, also really lonely because my whole like ecosystem was was tech people and they're like hey you want to come work at google and i'm like uh no i'm i'm really busy right now i'm like launching a beverage and and they're like okay like seems kind of weird like kind of odd you know and i'm i'm like yeah no it's not really a beverage it's like it's really i saw this you know crazy thing when i started drinking more water and I didn't like the taste of water. And they were like, Oh, okay, whatever. Like, are you spending a lot of time with your four kids too? You know, I mean, everybody was like discounting me immediately and saying, you know, essentially doubting that I was like, you know, doing something that was right. And so I, I feel like that message and, you know, and I'm hearing it back from so many people now, which is awesome that it's just, you know, to launch something, not only a new company, but an entirely new category is like, it's incredibly hard, but it's incredibly lonely, especially when you're way far ahead. I mean, like, you know, Steve Jobs talked about this much later on sort of, you know, his, his challenges with that. Right. And, and probably one of the reasons why I, you know, just, loved sort of what you know he represented because when you're really far ahead of what the rest of the world is doing it's like you know it, it, it's tough right people like, don't have context when they're trying to understand it they're saying okay i drink water you know i drink these drinks what, what's different about yours what it's all in your head right you don't have something to compare it to and then when you hear from people that you think are sort of godlike because they're in the beverage industry or they're in your category right and they say super condescending things to you that you've never heard in your life like sweetie americans love sweet this product is like not necessary and not like it won't go anywhere you know a lot of people have said to me like why didn't you hang up the phone on them? Why didn't you like, I was so shocked, but, but I'm really thankful for that conversation, frankly, because it made me realize that he was on a totally different, you know, mission. He wasn't even on a mission, but he was on a different river than me. Right. And so, and so the fact that I was sitting there searching for this, like, category expert to kind of wave their magic wand and say, you know, here's what you got to do here. I'll, I'll distribute your product or whatever, you know, is, is kind of counter and something that we talked about earlier that, you know, I think is really important for people to know, which is, you know, the, the, the people that are running these big companies, they don't have the vision, right? They've been trained to sort of like put the widget in the socket, right? Like it's just, that's what they do every single day until it's broken. And, and I think, you know, the other piece of this is growing up in tech, very different than, you know, a beverage company or a food company. It's this concept of like always adding on, always upgrading, always like, you know, this is good enough to go to market, but in six months from now, we're going to upgrade this in some way because the technology will be better or whatever. I grew up in that. And yeah. so when I brought that over to the beverage industry, you know, I wasn't sitting there saying, saying, here's a beverage and we're done. Like we are constantly, you know, changing this product and upgrading with new flavors and, you know, doing what, I mean, for the last 15 years, I mean, we are, con- we have, probably a bigger innovation team and put more into innovation than any other beverage company out there because it's just the mindset of how we think about things. 
So I'm going to, I'm going to regret not asking this. It's going to keep me up if I don't. You mentioned earlier that you had a crazy Jeff Bezos story from the mid nineties <laughs> and I did. And then yeah. I was going to ask, and then we kept going. Can we hear the, can we hear the story? Is it worth, is it worth telling at this point? I think people are interested yeah. to hear. Uh, yeah, pro- probably. So yeah. So basically I'll try, I'll try and keep it short. So I'm running this, this shopping. I, I viewed my role at AOL like a shopping mall. So we were trying to fill categories and, and we didn't have a book category and we had been turned down by Barnes and Noble um, and, uh, and borders and which were like the two, do you remember borders at all? Yeah. The behemoths, yeah. 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 And so we, we were turned to, down by those guys and we had filled every other category and we really wanted to do something in books. And so I'd heard about this guy, Jeff Bezos is 1996, like hanging up in Seattle. And anyway, I, I just figured I'll, you know, just call him up and, and see if we can go meet with them. And, and so flew from San Francisco, I had a colleague with me, we flew up there Southwest airlines. And I'm, I'm like driving around. He's like, said, meet me at the warehouse, whatever I'm driving 15 minutes after our meeting. I'm feeling really bad because we're 15 minutes late. And then I call him and I'm like, Hey, I'm really sorry. I cannot find your building at all. And he's like, well, you're 15 minutes late. We, you know, we can't meet. I'm like, seriously, like, I I don't know, like maybe I have the wrong directions. This is before Google maps, right? Like I'm like sitting here trying to figure, trying really hard to figure this out. And he's like, I got a lot of stuff to do tonight. He was like, I have to build bookcases. And I'm like, I am the best bookcase builder. I'm like, you have never seen somebody build bookcases. I had never built a bookcase before in my life. And he's like, and he's, I'm like joking with him because, you know, he's incredibly like rude, right? On the phone. I mean, it was just crazy. Trying to break him down a little bit. Finally, I like, you know, drive around. I'm like, I bet this is the building. And I get the building and knock on the door. And he's like, and he's like there. And he's like, you can seriously build like bookcases. I'm like, I can't. And by the way, do you realize you don't actually have like an address on the outside of your building? Like there's no, and they skip Let addresses. Let me stuff. slip this in as well. Let me just slip this in. Yeah. And he was like, Oh really? And I'm like, oh, dude, okay, whatever. All right. So I get in there and he like hands me these home Depot poles that were like building. And he's like, I, I got it. You know, we're getting lots of books in. This is when Amazon was only books for those of you who don't remember that. This is when Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world was building bookcases. He was building bookcases and it was, it was crazy. And he had, I'll never forget. He had a, um, his desk was a metal table. Like it was like, I mean, it wasn't even, it was like a, I guess they called them cardboard tables. I don't even know what they call them anymore. They, nobody has these anymore, but they have like gray metal legs and it was like, you know, fake wood on the top. It was like, I, I don't know. I, I remember thinking like, he doesn't even have a desk. Like he's like, you know, building bookshelf. Like it was, it, it was crazy. So anyway, the net of it is we're, we're trying to really size them up to, to see like, should we wait for a Barnes and Noble or borders or should we just go with this and kind of figure out how we, you know, move forward with like show what we can do and how we can build traffic on, on books. And so I said, so what, like, why do you think you can be successful? Like, how do you think you can like compete against like Barnes and Noble and borders? I mean, they're giant. And he said, do you ever go to the bookstore and ask the guy behind the counter for a recommendation on books. This is 1996. And I said, no, not really. Like I said, and he said, why? And I said, cause I read a ton and he's, and I said, you know, I don't really trust the guy or, or girl that's like standing behind the counter to really know like other recommendations based on, you know, what I liked. He said, that's it. And I said, what's it? And he said, the future of book sales is recommendations and search. And I remember like, do you ever have one of those moments where somebody says something to you and you did not know? It was almost revelatory. Oh, it was so massive. And what was interesting is my, my husband actually worked at Netscape and Netscape had just done a deal with Jeff Bezos and, and Amazon. Anyway, it, he, he had warned me that he was like, you know, not the nicest guy in the whole world and a little, you know, tough and stuff. And I remember going back to my Southwest Airlines flight and calling him and I'm like, he's a little rough, but 
he's really freaking smart. Like I was just like, and I, you know, when you hear these like nuggets, like these moments like that, and you think about, I mean, I, I was just talking about this the other day. This is like 1996. This is pre Google. I mean, for somebody to mention search before Google, like that's a big deal in and of itself. Totally. 24 years and recommendation. I mean, today, you know, recommendations. I mean, like how long though, did it really take the consumer to adapt to recommendations? Right? Like recommendations is a huge deal now on clearly on, on Amazon. But, you know, whenever I hear people thinking like, Oh, it's just going to happen overnight. Like consumers, like, you know, they rarely adapt quickly. We, we like want to, we want them to, but they don't. Right. And I think like 24 years later and, but he saw, he saw the vision and that to me was just, um, it was an, it was one of those moments that I think back on a lot. I'm, I'm glad I asked. That's a great story. And there aren't many people that have a story from that era of Amazon before Amazon, what it is today. So I appreciate that. I, you know, one of the things that I'm always trying to see, and we've talked, we've talked to amazing people here on the podcast. I've always been fascinated with conversing with anybody, but I mean, talking with somebody like you, who's had a great life to this point, you've done a lot of really cool things. You've worked for some really great companies. You've also raised four kids. You've (laughs) birthed four children and had a family throughout all of this, which is, it's unbelievable in and of itself. I have four kids myself and I'm married and I, I know what four kids is like, but the fact that you've been able to navigate the way that you have professionally and in the successes that you've seen is, is awesome. What are the constants that you have throughout all of this, that kind of ground you, that bring you back, that help you when, when you do face these, you know, the nose or the Starbucks pulling you off the, you know, off the shelf overnight and, and taking away that much of your business or, you know, the executive at the company saying, sweetie, you're, you're in way over your head. Don't even, you know what I mean? Like nobody wants to hear what you're talking about. These, these moments, what are the things that ground you, that bring you back? What are the, what are the kind of constants that you have in your life that give you hope even when things seem hopeless? I mean, I think humor around my house, I value humor a lot. Like I, I think there's, there's always something going on, you know, and I think growing up the last of five, like I just, I think having a big family is just a lot of fun. Like I just, I, you know, there's always something going on and some sort of chaos constantly going on. But I feel like uh, it's another thing I, I talk about in the book, my son, Keenan, who's 18, when he was 12, he saw Sheryl Sandberg on TV talking about lean in and women aren't CEOs. And he's like, mom, why aren't women CEOs? And I thought, you know, Oh God, do, uh, am I really like, do I have to talk to him about it? Like at, at this table, like, yeah. I'm like, here we go. And I was like, I don't know. And he was like, like, and he's like, well, you've been a CEO for, I don't know, my whole life. Like why, why can't women be CEOs? And I'm like, I, I don't know. And then the next day he, uh, he came home from school and he plays a ton of tennis and he was like, why, why are there like boys teams, tennis teams and there's girls tennis teams. I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, like there's girls that are way better than some of the guys on the team. Then I, I would much rather play with them. They're stronger. They're like faster, like the whole thing. And I was like, I don't know. Why don't you change it? And he was like, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to petition the school to see if we can like do this. So the point is I didn't know when they were like little, what I was instilling in them, in leading in, in ultimately doing what I do every day, but also enjoying what I do every single day. Like, it's like, you know, people have said like, you know, how do you keep things separate? Like, I mean, I'm married to my chief operating officer, right? Like my husband, we're like, we sit in separate rooms, we're doing different zoom calls and whatever. But, you know, clearly, it's like, there's a lot of ebbs and flows of like work and like, I mean, it's been our business, right? Where like my kids have seen this, but having said that now where, you know, I've got three in college right now and one in high school, like all the teachers are constantly coming to me and saying like, your kids just like they, you know, they have these topics that are just like so meaty that are so mature their head. Like, you know, my kids would tell that story about Jeff Bezos too. Like they think about those kind of things because they've heard all the stories. And sometimes they're just like, I don't want to hear the stories anymore. Like, can you stop telling me the same story? 
right? Like they're, you know, they're just right. They're, they're like me as a kid, like what, like facing, you know, I'm still their mom and, you know, and, but I think what, what they've seen is that even when there's really bad and things happen and again, like, I'm not like, Oh, great. Starbucks just kicked us out. Like, you know, this is perfect. You know, I, I'm just like, that sucks, you know, or like my kids knew, you know, the difference between private equity and, and venture and angel list when they were like in sixth grade, you know, like they, they know the stuff. And I think that, that again, it, it's like, can you actually be a role model? Can you do the stuff that you're not supposed to be doing according to society. We, you know, I'm working on a huge initiative right now, right now in Washington and hoping to take it before Congress around clean water. Like I'm a private, I'm a CEO of a company. Like I am not a lobbyist. I I used to work for John McCain when I was living in Arizona, but I was also an appointee for Obama for entrepreneurship. Like I, I don't, that's as close as I'm coming to government. Instead, I like want to create change and I want to, you know, go do something that I have a lot of information on water. And so my, my kids are like, you know, wait, so how do you actually like get a bill before Congress? Like, how do you do that? Like, I'm like, I don't really know, but I'm going to go figure this stuff out. And they're, and you know, they'll bring their friends over and their friends will be like, wait, you're getting a bill before Congress. Like, can we come if you get before Congress? Like, that'd be super cool. So again, doing the impossible and enjoying what you're doing is, is like, I think the most important thing you can do as a parent. And like when you're depressed and you like hate what you're doing like that, like that reflects on every single thing that you do. I love the perspective. I, I, like I said at the beginning, my biggest concern was that we could, we could go all day and ask you a ton of questions and, and glean as much uh, wisdom oh. from your experiences as possible. So we appreciate it. It's been, been fantastic. You're yeah. so nice. Well, well, listen, or you can read a lot of the stories or go yeah. on audible and, and, uh, yeah, I'm gonna get the, I'm gonna get the audible book. Yeah. But, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited to, to hear more. I, so the book is undaunted. There's an audible version. Go on Amazon. We've talked a lot about Amazon today. You can get it, order it. And then you said the website's a drink right? And you can go on and order your case of water and all shapes and sizes and flavors and, and enjoy that. Exactly. Like any store I see it, you see it everywhere you go. Thank you so much for. Yeah. For thanks time. guys. It's an absolute I, pleasure to meet you. And, and uh, maybe this will be one of those opportunities that, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch. Yeah, definitely. All right. We'll take it right. easy. Thanks, Have a great Kara. rest of the week. Thanks. Thank I you so much. Kara. Hello, it's Corey here. And I just want to thank you so much for listening into the hope strategy podcast. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are enjoying having these amazing conversations with these incredible individuals talking about hope. We'd love it if you wouldn't mind liking, subscribing, and leaving us a review on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere that you listen to your podcasts and share it with anybody you feel that can benefit from these messages of hope. Thank you so much for listening to the Hope Strategy Podcast.